Wow. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hmm. Wow. It's good to see everybody. Hello. Aloha. Ah. ah, great to see everybody. Take the time to see everybody because it's a good mudita feeling. Mudita is good. We had mudita yesterday too. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> mudita, mudita. Okay. okay. All right, Michelle, I think we're ready when okay. you're, you are. I'm just still looking at everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My favorite part. Okay. <laughs> Wow, it's so cold. Japan, Canada, America, East Coast, West Coast, Minnesota. <laughs> oh. oh, wow, Arizona. Hmm. So today it, it, it feels like um, a good day to just, it might be that you haven't felt like you've really taken a good breath for a, a long time. You know, just know that you might notice your body hasn't been relaxed for a long time. Yeah. long, long time. It's going to take time to receive this relaxation a little bit at a time, knowing there's much work ahead, as they say, as we say. So let your attention um, notice your body posture. I, I tend to like to check if I have a sense of even leaning forward a little bit, like trying a little bit too hard. It's a very light tweak of the attention of, of settling back a little bit. Or sometimes it's also for me a settling inward. Really letting the attention drop to your hands, your feet. It's time to get some space from all the thinking or even all the feeling. Just feel the sensations in the bottom of our feet. And connecting with the four great elements within our body, a strong connection with the earth element, 
we can really connect with that and the bottom of our feet, the bottom of our hands, where our sit bones connect with our cushion or bench or chair. Feeling any, the support of earth, hardness, softness. And the support of our bones in our body. All that hardness. Holding us. Muscles. Of, we start feeling the temperature of our bodies on the vast range of skin, the surface of the skin, the heat, the coolness, warmth, cold. The changing microscopic temperatures. Sometimes we can feel energy streaming in our body. It can feel sometimes flowing or streaming or sometimes stuck. We're just noticing it, not trying to adjust or fix or manipulate. And with the air, it's a great place to investigate. Who am I? At what point as it comes in? Is it I or me or mine? As it goes out, at what point is it no longer I or me or mine? We start to anchor again away from the thinking or feeling being so predominant to even for a half a breath, the breath being, the air being what is predominant. As a way to find calm and stability, quiet, Solitude. And here is where we can really appreciate. You can start again anytime with wherever the breath is, it can be the end of the rising movement, halfway through the falling movement. Some people have a pause at the end of the falling. When the attention moves away, it's like when we remember to come back to receive this movement of life, of air, of aliveness. We can start anywhere. It doesn't have to be at the so-called beginning.
it can be interesting to notice. We can be halfway through the rising. Notice a sound, a thought. And come back to the end of the rising. No problem. Remembering that the thinking can be a kind of way we stabilize when we aren't connected with the truth of every moment is new. Each moment is changing. The thinking uh, in the past or the future is a way to feel secure. It can be helpful to really appreciate that when we're connected to movement of the breath or the sensations in our body changing. Connected but not controlling. We're safe and protected with the truth of things as they are. Remembering that if sounds come, to see if we can remember to receive them. Not through the thought process, the vibration, textures. If you notice some sounds or a sound noticing, if they're pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral at times. Checking if you have a sense of no inside, no outside. You're not trying to make anything happen. We can explore how we're perceiving reality. Based on past memory or thoughts. Receiving the aliveness of our experience without going through that thought process of memory. And if we start feeling confused or thinking too much about anything, just let the attention settle into our hands. Breath. Or sound. Noticing at times that relief of calm, solitude. Independence. Freedom. Whatever appears, we have that ability to connect 
anger, sleepiness, calm, restlessness, doubt, wanting, sadness, boredom, as well as the body sensations, breath, sound. Just be careful of basing the experience on something from the past. Form our thoughts about it. Staying grounded with your body in the present. and exploring when you're taking something personally and when you understand that whatever is appearing isn't personal. Exploring both. with as much kindness as you can.
So just um, <clears throat> for the last few minutes of the sitting, appreciating your intention at times to be kind, to care about pain, your own and others, the pain of this world. Our intention to appreciate the joy in this world and the gratitude, the appreciation to really let that in, the goodness of it. And to have this intention to be with things just as they are, this unconditional acceptance, peace, the happiness of peace. To really receive the goodness of, of that. the goodness of the intention to understand rather than to judge. Thank you, Michelle. How's everybody doing out there? People, people look good. People feeling happy, feeling relieved, Karen. <laughs> Feeling like you won. Mm. <laughs> and then I'm happy for you. That's how we practice our mudita. May your happiness, may your success, may your achievements uh, continue uninterrupted. May you keep winning feeling the goodness of that. It's funny though, I was, I had this thought, maybe, maybe people won't come today. They're so, they're feeling so good. So much of the time people um, come to meditation, come to retreats with all of their griefs and sadness and ask how you know oh <laughs> what does the dhamma say about this or i'm getting old and how can my meditation practice help or my children are being like this or my parents are being like this or here are my problems how what did the buddha say how can i overcome this feeling 
and we treat the Dhamma like our bleak weather friend, right? We don't always think that we need the Dhamma when things are going good and then we get what we want. We never, I can almost say never, have people say, oh, I'm feeling so elated. I got what I want. How do I work with this? How do I, how do I manage this? <laughs> how do I overcome this? How do I not be imprisoned by this? Will this ever end? Why is this happening to me? Mm. <laughs> but it's true. And it's true that the Dhamma is here for all of those times and actually just as important, you know. Um, I think sometimes, what is that phrase? When we're on the eagle's wings, right? We don't uh, always feel like we need or want to be grounded in the the truth of the undependability of things, the unsubstantiality of things, the the dukkha that might even be in our um, happiness and our our relief and our um, even in the sukha, even in the pleasant, where there is unpleasant, you know, where does the mind um, find sorrow in in even its rejoicing? And I think it's it's hard because of course we don't want to lose our connection to the buoyancy and the goodness and the happiness and the relief that we might feel, but we also don't want to fall into delusion and um, trick ourselves, you know, into thinking this is a permanent state or could be a permanent state or um, maybe even to some degree, I think probably people even from the election have already felt the next day. It's like maybe if you're happy about it, the the day after Christmas, you know, it's sort of that like, oh, it's not quite as something as that the morning of Christmas, you know. <laughs> you have to you have to keep reminding yourself that you're this good thing happened, you know. You can watch the mind do that. You can see the mind going back to social media, you know, to find a new meme or a new something to make you laugh or remind you that it's like, all oh, right, 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 we're happy, we're happy, we're happy. Then it's like, oh, and it kind of dissipates. And and then we can start to see the um, some of that painful nature, you know, the sort of like soberness or just like, oh, the already the arguing starting again or the war comes back so quickly, you know, and how fragile the sort of sense of like, oh, hopefulness or elation or relief might be. And I'll say more about it in a moment around like, you know, it's the Dhamma isn't trying to take any of that away. It's not trying to take away our happiness or relief or sense of um, accomplishment or hopefulness, you know, about the future. But it's, it is trying to bring it back into the same perspective, you know, that remembering uh, how much we are prisoners to what the Buddha called the Loka Dhamma, the ways of the world, this this spectrum of uh, gain and loss and pleasure and pain and uh, status or disgrace, praise and blame, you know, these these kind of four matrices that we live in and, and that there's always some degree of, of gaining or losing or pleasure or pain or uh, praise or blame or status or disgrace that we're sort of navigating and that these are unavoidable, right? They'll, they they will happen in our lives no matter what, but the degree to which we f believe our happiness, our deepest happiness is dependent upon them is the degree to which we suffer basically, right? Uh, and it doesn't mean that we don't find some relief in the pleasant, right? And that we don't, um, uh, yeah, take take the goodness of the relief from from the oppression of hardship and of anger and of fear and of all these things and the sense of hopefulness, but that we recognize it as a respite, not a refuge. That's really the most important teaching.
I read a quote recently from Suzuki Roshi, something like, even if the sun came up in the West, the path of the Bodhisattva would remain the same. And I think there's something very powerful in that, right? Even if we might not be doing Bodhisattva work technically in this tradition, that sense of like, even if the sun came up in the West, even if no matter who won the election, uh, our work is the same. Where is that sense of like, wow, the stability in that, the e the lightness in that, but also the strength in that, how powerful that is, that we're not boggled by the reality of, of how up and down, how out of control, how topsy-turvy actually reality is and proves to be in every moment. Where do we have the resources of caring, of kindness, of connection in these, in these ways to deal with the uh, the ways we are tossed around in the ocean of experience and the unpredictability of things, to care for our hearts, to take joy in the joy of ourselves or in the world around us, right? To not deny us ourselves that, but also that it be balanced with that equanimity, with that understanding that things are as they are. The mind has the ability to be free regardless of the conditions that present itself in our body, in our minds, in the world around us, in the world far beyond us, that we can't lose sight of the goal of liberation, even when we are trying to win the game of samsara, right? Even when we know we can't really win. Samsara, you cannot win. It never, <laughs> it's, its nature is to be undependable in that way. Some people can make it go pretty well for a long time. Some people have conditions working against them for a long time. But in the end, we all meet the same fate on some very fundamental level. The Sayada who's been uh, teaching our retreat in, in Burma over the last few years, I think just the last couple of years, he started telling the yogis a certain story in the beginning that's sort of been fun uh, about how his teacher, um, who was also Michelle and Stephen's teacher, Sayada Upandita, um, it's, you know, in Burma, how you would you would ask if someone's doing okay, say, oh, nekandela, or you'd say to a monk or a nun, nekandela peya, and the, the response of, oh, you know, I'm doing well, kambare, uh, or not so well, nene mm, makamu. And uh, that Saira Upandita, Saira Ji would tell Saira and, and his other students, uh, don't say you're good, never say you're good. When someone asks you, oh, nekanala, ne how are you? You say, nedabade, basically means like, not too bad. <laughs> And his, his rationale is like, you're never really good. If you have a body, you're never really good. You shouldn't be dishonest. You should be that sensitive to the fact that like there's dukkha. If you, if you have a body baseline, there's gonna be some ache and some pain and some, some unpleasantness there, no matter what. It does, might not be excruciating, it's there. Better to just say, not bad, oh, we're doing okay. you know. And so every morning, uh, say it, I would ask the yogis that and he expect everyone to say, how are you today? Okay, say it all. Not bad, say it all. <laughs> and it can seem again a little bit like oh, sober, you know. Mm, but the Dhamma is sober. Mm, and that's okay, you know. It's it doesn't mean that it's taking away from our joy or taking away from our uh, range of emotion, you know. I mean, we have it's like this, it's gonna be the same response. It's like, oh, feel it, explore it try to understand it, right? Just like when a few weeks ago, people are like, oh, I feel so ashamed. I'm happy that the president is sick. And it's like, we're not gonna say, oh, you shouldn't feel ashamed or you shouldn't feel happy or you shouldn't be angry with what this person is doing. That's like never the response. Oh, really, you shouldn't be feeling that. It's always like, okay, that's what's happening. Check it out. Can you be genuinely interested in it, right? Can you explore, oh, 
what are the range? We think it's this one kind of wall of experience. What is the range of flavors in the heart of the mind? Oh, where is their cruelty? Where is their joy? You know, in the the alleviation of other people's sorrow, right? That that's something we think is painful might go away. Someone that's causing pain might disappear. Oh, is that unwholesome? Is it not? You know, where where is this? Explore, explore grief, explore sadness, explore wanting you know that's always going to be our encouragement it's never like oh that's really the wrong feeling you're doing this wrong you know it's always like oh why what's happening why does the heart feel like that is the protection it wants right now Mm, does it feel like it helps does it feel like it helps in certain ways but doesn't help in other ways where's the dukkha even in the joy and so we're going to say of course the same thing here right? Mm. Oh, there's joy. Wonderful. And there's relief. Wonderful. Explore it. How long does it last? What's our relationship to that? Where do we keep feeling like we need to shore it up? Where do we let it go and have something else arise? How much are we identified with the view, with the um, spectrum of ideas and stuff around that we've kind of woven together around our, our joy? our happiness? Where do we take joy in someone else's loss? How does that feel in the heart? How does that feel in the mind? So always this encouragement to explore what's happening, never the wrong thing, never say, oh, really no one should be happy. Everyone should just feel this neutral all the time. No, of course we don't say that. And of course, some people will hear that anyway in the Dhamma. But it's like the neutrality comes in the approach. It's like, oh, that willingness to not be totally consumed by it, that willingness to explore, oh, every condition, uh, every phenomena is the result of conditions. Mm, What are the conditions in the mind and the heart and the body that led to this arising? What are the conditions that sustain it? What are the conditions that deplete it? You know, where are these very beautiful, wholesome feelings? What starts to get in the way of them? Where does it start to um, turn into something more tight, more uh, necrotic, you know? Where does it turn into something unwholesome? Our relationship to these beautiful feelings, these beautiful emotions. Always important to explore. Something that Michelle said in the instructions, it's, I think, so important in terms of our meditation practice, you know, when we're sitting and trying to observe whatever, you know, whatever primary object we might have um, decided upon or landed upon, the breath, the hearing, the body. Um, Of course, we, we will often notice that we get caught in thought, we get lost in thought, you know, from those of you who have been sitting meditation for 40 years or people who may have just joined today for the first time. It's a very common experience that we all know. And and often there is this sense of like, oh, it's the problem. Thinking is the problem and being with the direct experience of the six sense stores as they're rising and passing is the right way. And we get hard on ourselves about, you know, these types of things that arise and Again, our encouragement is always, it's like, explore it. Try to understand what are the conditions that lead self to arise, the sense of meanness, right? The sense of um, thinking or, you know, uh, rumination, uh, uh, fantasy to start to happen. And it's really true that you almost always see it as as a way of the heart, the mind to try to find some stability in the uncontrollability of things. It's very impersonal. Even even the sense of self is impersonal, right? That's how funny, right? That's how ironic it is. It's like, oh no, this is this is a congealing, it's a coalescing, it's a trying to create a kind of plateau from which we then can watch and observe and, and try to make sense of and try to slow down this flood of experience. Truly watch that, you know, just encourage that in your meditation practice, the sense of 
no, it, it provides the sense of me, the sense of self, the thinking, the, the conjuring of ideas, the getting lost in fantasy and thought. It's creating a, a sort of sense of stability, of a platform, of a plateau from which we then can operate and act and feel like we're in a little more control. It, but it's not just thinking, it's every, it's like all of these emotions that we think of even as problems, grief. Someone asked about that the other week. How do we work with grief? How do you, can we start to see that even grief is an attempt to slow things down? It's an attempt to solidify, to, to, to create a platform, right? To create stability. To really see that anger wanting, longing, uh, you know, jubilation. <laughs> There's these ways in which it's like, oh, where, where is the mind trying to stabilize, even in the unpleasant? Because even an, un, even an unpleasant stability is preferable to the uncontrollable nature of things as they are in, for most of us, most of the time. And to really understand that's understandable, right? That it's, and that's, again, it's impersonal in the sense it's only because the mindfulness and concentration aren't strong enough in that moment. There's just, it's just a matter of practice. It's just a matter of development and, and the mind hearts feeling more and more comfortable in the uncontrollability, in the instability, not needing things to be one way or the other. And, and the way that it does that is by seeing it more and more clearly. Oh, it sees these phenomena arising and passing. It sees that there isn't a solid, coherent self in that. And while there are phases of that that might be really terrifying and scary and, and um, feel unstable, the, the, the more we could become familiar with that aspect of reality, that aspect of the truth of things, uh, the more ease there is, the more peace there is, the more it's okay that things be a little wild, actually, that our practice feel less under control, right? We have to start to see that too. It's like, oh, our practice might start to feel less contained, less controlled, less solid, and a little wilder in that sense, because that's actually the way things are actually happening. And then we can see, oh, maybe the mind doesn't need to congeal around self, around our views as much. or even when it does, that it's okay, we understand. Oh, there's just the mindfulness isn't that strong right now. The concentration doesn't feel like a, a solid enough protection right now. No problem, no problem at all. It's uh, not a thing to get, you know, worried about, to get frustrated by, to get um, threatened by. We have these um, back and forth. We have this growing comfort with the instability and with the heart's mind's need to, to gain more stability. Let me do that. Trying to find the time. Hmm. It's a very powerful time we're in, you know, and I think that it's a hard time, but a powerful time as a yogi, you know, to be able to um, explore all of these things, to be able to see the dukkha even in our happiness, the dukkha in our relief, and to not feel threatened by that, right? To not feel like that's taking away something but to really trust that we are seeking a deeper happiness. We're seeking a deeper liberation from uh, the mind's contentment being based on certain conditions, things being the way that we want them to be. It's the most fundamental really teaching of the Buddha in some ways. And 
we can lose it. And I think what's hard is that it actually, by, by not willing to let that go, we actually lose our ability to, to go deeper with love, to go deeper with compassion. You know, it's like, well, I'll hear even colleagues talk about the Dharma in the sense of like, you know, until the society has, has um, healed all of its traumas, you know, and where we've moved beyond racism and sexism and class oppression and uh, environmental degradation that, that we won't, none of us can be free. And that's not true or, or not free in this way, right? It's like fundamentally the opposite of what the Buddha taught which is to say that conditions do matter. Yes, like it's so helpful to have supportive conditions to be able to practice, right? To not be in prison, to not be oppressed in the many ways we can be oppressed in order to find some stability for the mind, some rest, some relief. But as soon as you think that the, your liberation in this sense is dependent upon any conditions in the world being one way or another, that that's not, the liberation the Buddha spoke of, and that it actually starts to twist the nature of what is then compassion, what is then love, that is beyond conditions, that is uh, beyond things, needing things to be one way or the other. And the trick is it doesn't mean getting rid of our preferences or getting rid of our views or our perspective on things. I, I, I hope not for my own sake. <laughs> I'm, I have of the most fixed views politically of probably anyone I know, uh, of the most radical views. And yet I also see the dukkha in that. I truly see the suffering in that. I truly see the, um, the way in which those views are trying to help me make sense of the world and my role in it and what I think is righteous and what I think is wicked, um, but that that is entirely different than the process of liberation that's going on internally. And that to a large degree or to a total degree, and the, 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 the fixation on my views, the fixation on this being right or wrong, or this being the way things should be or shouldn't be, um, that gets into all of the lokadama, that gets into all of my preferences, is um, just as much of a trap. But I also don't need to get rid of the tendency, right? It's like the tendency dissipates through insight. It's like, oh yes, of course we want these things. Of course we, these kinds of responsibilities matter to us. Of course these kinds of freedoms matter to us. And yet to understand that actually there is a contentment, there's a happiness, there's a peace, there's a capacity to love that is beyond those things. That actually has nothing to do with those things, which is the only thing that might give us some ability to connect with, to care for, to find some common ground with people who might be at a, extreme opposite of our political viewpoints, of our views of how the world should be run, of who's winning, who's losing, who's right, who's wrong. So these things, they have their places of connection, but to not confuse them, right? To understand that each moment is new, each moment is fresh. When there's joy, oh, we feel the goodness of that. We feel the relief in that. We feel the beauty in that. But to be careful not to imprison ourselves in that. To recognize it as a respite, not a refuge. The deepest freedom coming only from the insight into the nature of phenomena, the undependable, the uncontrollable, and the karmically bound relationship between intention and action. Mm. So feel good, feel happy, share that, feel where can we feel happy for the happiness of others? Where can we feel care about the pain of others, the worry of others, the fear of others? Where do we have access to love regardless of 
pleasure or pain or view or position? Where do we see the worthiness of all beings to be cared for? Where do we take responsibility for our actions, our mental actions, our verbal actions, our physical actions in our lives and the world? Where do we accept the inevitable karma that unfolds in the world around us based on past actions? Support ourselves and everyone to be as caring and considerate as possible moving forward. So thank you. And um, we do have some time now for questions, if anyone has any about um, your practice in general, Michelle's talk, Michelle's offering uh, my talk. Um, you can raise your hand using the little blue button uh, that's in the, if you click on participants, um, there should be a little blue raise your hand button if you haven't before. Try to keep an eye on the chat thing, though that's not usually how we try to answer questions unless people can't get the other thing going. Um, now I'm just going to take a minute to try to figure out how my screen got weird and rearrange things. There we go. There we go. Okay, are you there? Hi. Yeah. Hey. Uh, uh, I, I, I feel like I'm a. Uh, I I definitely felt um, joy, or more relief, after yesterday, and um, also. I felt like a party pooper a little bit and I I as the day went on and um just uh, a lot of car horns and people yelling continued um just a little bit of doubt and questioning started to happen and and some thoughts on well, that's like, it's not gonna, nothing is gonna change. It's not like happy ending and we're gonna live happily ever after. Um, and like like you were saying, I think, I, I think I know, and at that moment I could hold those two um, feeling and thoughts together um, not deciding which is what I, I definitely appreciate and understand the relief of it. And also I understand the difficulty of what's to come, I think. And, but that was happening, I think, because I was in a day long and I was sitting a lot mm. and I can find myself already um time to time it's it wants to take one one side or the other and uh yeah that's not helpful <laughs> but um that 
that's that's what happens is it is it yeah <laughs> it's so great all the yeah, time it's awesome totally i what i love about that amongst other things is like is that it's it's like it, it could be anything but that it's the car horns like are what started to get to you right it's like it's that sense of like it's going to be something right that starts to like deflate us or it could be just a thought but like the, like at some point it's like oh god that starts it turns from like joyful to irritating or something you know um yeah i think it's it's so powerful and it's so it's so hard <laughs> it's so beautiful you know of um everything you just said, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't even feel like there's really much to say, except for that it's like, yeah, that, that there is this dance between the optimism and the pessimism and the, on one hand, the heart seeking stability in either of them, but also not trusting either of them, which is also like not not also liberated either, right? There's some place where it's like, oh, I, like you don't trust the joy or you, 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 you don't, where we don't allow ourselves to feel happy. We don't allow ourselves to feel good about something that feels good. That is like a huge relief, you know? Like, so that you have to be careful too, right? Of like, oh, where are we also undermining our access to like beautiful emotions and seeing those patterns, you know, and then seeing the tendency to be despondent. And then it's like, oh God, but you don't, you know that the heart is just also seeking a solidity in that and there's something that becomes distasteful in that also for you which is great i mean it's it's like it's very it's wonderful you know but i think it's like it's hard it's a harder path to try to do what you're doing and what we're doing of not deny ourselves the reality of our emotional world and the truth of the views and the response to that and our analysis and our understanding and um, to not also be totally beholden in that and that you know we, we first come to practice often and it's like oh it's so revelatory and you feel like wow there's all this more flexibility and room and then you know i don't know a couple of years into it it just gets more mature right and you start to see all of like the the, the thicket in there you know and then i think that's most of our practice life you know <laughs> it's like working our way through these like you know and then finding our way through into a clearing and then finding ourselves back in the dense and into a clearing and in the dense and it's like oh that it's a different relationship that we have to practice over time but that it's very beautiful and it's very pure you know but it's confusing and exhausting you know at times so i hope also just you know, all of us, it's like that we also need a break, you know, there's the times of like, oh my God, again, of wholesome distraction, even from the celebration and how funny that is, you know, it's like, we think that that's what we've wanted this whole time is a celebration. And yes, there's a relief in that. And then it's like, oh, it's like, I'm always been the type of person that like going to a party or I'm like, find some excuse to go to the bathroom as often as I can, you know, <laughs> just like get a break. This is like, okay, I need like, I need like a timeout. So yeah, finding some, and, and the practice isn't always that break, right? It's also like something outside of practice and finding something that's just like not getting you more into the volatility and intensity of, of all of the, the wildness of our response to everything. Yeah. I don't know, Michelle, do you have any? You should be able to unmute now. Sorry when you, yeah, there you go. And your mic is down there. Just one little thing to add, which is uh, remembering that experience called the near enemy of the Brahma Vihara. Uh, so the experience of near enemy means that the experience seems so much like compassion or seems so much like mudita but isn't um, I think that this another angle in what you asked about or what Jesse's answering is around this place where the um, appreciation of the joy and we could have watched that in ourselves yesterday if we were experiencing the joy that it can shift to a near enemy it feels like enjoyment and, and appreciation, but it's actually becoming um, like an over enthusiasm. 
you know, and it, it, it'll, you, you described it well, but I'm just naming it, that it, it'll start feeling ungrounded. And probably the car horn started to feel, you know, even though I think unpleasantness can be grounding, but it can, it can kind of note, we notice that we're getting unbalanced and it's the equanimity practice, which is what came. So what you described was beautiful. You know, and that's why we're all smiling because we, we get that you got it. It's like that sense of, yeah, um, this is enjoyable, but it can get out of balance and that it's that connecting back with things are as they are that balances it. Yeah, so that, that it, I think it's a very important place to practice because uh, for a lot of people, I think there isn't a lot of um, pleasantness happening, at least this past year. And so that the, the joy actually, we're not, you know, most people aren't getting as much practice <laughs> with, with being with it, as, you know, especially something this dr dramatic. And um, it's the near enemy isn't bad or wrong. And you hear us talking about it so much more. We'll talk about how grief will be the experience that seems so much like compassion, but isn't because compassion actually feels good. That within, with mudita, it can be very nuanced and not as clear when we're starting to get you know, I like to think of it as like when I look at the, the um, imagery of the Buddha, that you don't, you see that sublime smile. You don't see somebody getting, you know, going off like a rocket. You don't see him like laughing his head off, right? It's like there's this sense of a, a balance in it. And we, with enjoyment, I could feel yesterday as people were um, so happy, my my sister, I called my sister because she's been not well, and I, uh, her voice was hoarse. <laughs> and my sister's m more intensely emotional. And I said, why is your voice hoarse? And she said, oh, I've been screaming with happiness. I've been screaming for hours. And I was like, wow, oh, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You know, it's great. But, you know, she was, as Jesse saying, she was exhausted, you know, but it was cool because um, she's had, she's been in the hospital for three weeks. She's having had a really hard time, so it was cool that she was feeling it. But I think there's that sense of like, wow. Um, and then you get to see how it goes from that to attachment, right? We can see we don't want to come down. You know, who wants to come down to Duca Land again, right? Like it's like to, like oh yeah, you know, not exactly. Uh, a clean sweep here. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to feel the joy, to take it in, and to also be very realistic with um, what's happening. Yeah. Thank God for the car horn. <laughs> I'll see Tracy. Hi. Um, so well, thanks so much. Um, I think yesterday I felt like I could breathe in a way that I haven't <laughs> in some time. Um, and it's the, the thing I want to ask about is um, so in the midst of this, this intensity this week, um, I saw a friend um, and that evening she came down with a cough. And um, so this has been going on through I haven't I don't know yet the results she she ended up getting tested um and there were I mean, 
I wore a mask, we were outside, but I was with her for a while and there were things that occurred that, that I wasn't that comfortable with. And this is someone I really love. And um, so, uh, it, it feels, so there's been this process with it um, where part of what, you know, I just noticed a lot of wanting, the mind wanting to blame myself, wanting to judge her, um, Um, connecting with um, my fear, fear of what would happen to her, to me. And, and s s since that, there's been this sort of, it feels like this kind of tentative place where I, I, keep noticing, um, I'm just not sure if it's equanimity. It doesn't feel, maybe it is. It, it feels like there isn't enough in the system in me right now to um, be other than in this, it feels like this tentative place of calm. <laughs> I, I, um, I'm waiting to hear. Um, and I'm noticing, I really wish I could feel more kindness. But there's also like kind of an acceptance that I can't right now. And so there's, there is this appreciation really for the, um, practice like to see how um i haven't totally gone down these roads that the mind really wants to go down and at the same time it doesn't feel uh it feels like there's like there's a little hardness there's a little you know and then the mind wants to um wants more wants it to be better <laughs> and I <laughs> um, and I don't really know what my question is, but just sort of maybe just how to keep practicing with it because um, it's felt like a little like I I just don't want to go there. I, I, and I don't know if it's just concentration, like I'm staying in this place that just feels steady right now. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Anyway, I just needed to talk about it a little, even talking about it feels like it's opened things. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's so... Uh, there's so much to say about how just intense everything is right now with this kind of thing, you know, and just how uh, how incredible and how impossible it feels to be living in this way for so long, you know, this sort of like, whether it's the seclusion, but also the 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 sense that like any social interaction could kill us, you know, like that that's so crazy. That's so intense, you know, and the burden of that on a day to day. And then, then you have a questionable interaction or something you just don't feel like super secure in, or you know, like there's like a little ping of like, oh, there's a real threat and how that reverberates in our hearts. You know, it's just, there's so much to it. So we will we could say more about that. I mean, I think I, there's the basic level of where I just feel like it's that it's very, it feels very pure sort of what you're doing and like the intentional and unintentional parts of it in terms of how your heart is responding in terms of maybe the tendencies to go into like a really difficult kind of spirals with it, the steadiness that might be a sort of shutdownness that feels like a little bit of a protection, the, the, the wanting to feel the sort of opposite kind of emotions and trying to get those, but you can't, like that spread right there is just like so 
fundamental, you know, it's so basic and so good and so important to just get this dynamic of like, oh yeah, something very evocative, something very intense has arisen. You know that you don't want to get pulled into the eddy, you know, of these sort of like vortexes. And so you see that, oh yeah, there's a way that the, the mind might sort of be protecting itself in this sort of neutral sort of dull space, you know, that feels sort of steady, which is great. And then the, the sense of like, oh, the, the part of our heart that wants relief by feeling the opposite. Oh, the love, the not wanting to feel what we're feeling. And also that you get that you can't totally trust that either. It's so important. It's so powerful actually, right? To get, it's like, okay, yes, there are times where we can see that there's love as an antidote to fear and things like that. But sometimes it's also an escape and that you are in a place where you don't wanna be unreal, right? You wanna be with what's really happening. And there's also the recognition that the full voltage of it might be more than the mind can handle at this point. So you're in this kind of like bouncing between the sort of magnetic fields of these things, you know? And just to get that that's very difficult but very important and that you're doing it. And that that ultimately the practice is like, if you're going to try to feel the love that you can't be out of a denial of the fear or the anxiety, right? That it's like, you do need to get into some relationship with the fear itself, with the anxiety itself, with the worry, with the anger, which whatever the flavors that we are, are so distasteful, even if it's just in small doses because you don't wanna kind of go into the spiral and then balance yourself in whatever way is sort of naturally happening or through distraction or whatever. But then you might find that you also, if doing that, that there's a softening actually, right? That the hardness of that stabilizer doesn't need to be as hard. There's a softening. Feeling your own pain, feeling your own fear, feeling your own worry might have be an introduction into more sense of compassion for yourself. Maybe that's not the love flavor, but the compassion flavor you know, of like, oh, caring about your own pain and your own fear, caring about this other person, understanding how hard it is to be trying to kind of navigate all these relationships and interactions in this time. And, you know, where can you feel that sense of like giving yourself an emotional break from it? Um, you know, all of that just feels important and feels like you're, you're in it, you're doing it, you know. Um, I don't know, Michelle, do you have any more you want to offer in terms of, yeah. Oh, your microphone, Michelle. Okay. Um, I think it's a really um, edgy place when we can't feel kind. You know, I think it's just that if you're the type that cares and often feels kind, then I, I just think it's really beautiful you said that. You could say it and also... Um, how important it is to accept and it, it can help I think when I have that experience it helps me understand better how the world is you know that we all want it to be more people to be more kind and to when we have that experience it helps us understand better why people aren't more kind I hope that's clear I think it can lead us to more compassion for when that happens for people and how it can become even a, a pattern over generations and families. It's, and I think that uh, there was one particular point in my life where I experienced that um, almost like surprisingly that my heart had to um, protect itself in a way I had never experienced. And I, this is when I really realized that being numb is an emotion. It was some years ago, but it was so revelatory that it was like, I'm not saying you're saying you're numb. You don't sound numb, but it's, it's like um, there are times when resistance protects us and to actually notice the nuances of the equanimity side of things. It's like, so maybe there's no, <laughs> the first three Brahma Viharas aren't, accept, aren't accessible, but actually watching the nuances between waiting with indifference 
or waiting with numbness and waiting for with equanimity. That's incredible practice. And there's so many nuances with it. It's like that near, near enemy again, the experience that seems so much like equanimity, which is that deep acceptance, right? That un without conditions that this is what she did, this is what you did, and accepting that that's what happened, because it happened. We don't accept it because it's right. We accept it because it happened, right? Like that's the huge difference with equanimity that's hard to understand. When we understand it, we get it's not condoning. But it, we get that it's human <laughs> to um, not be perfect. So it, it's just really, I think that that sense of, um, often I'll have an experience now where someone will really get that the mask is actually a protection, that they're, that they're not just doing that mask for themselves, that they're doing the mask for everyone else, right? That that, that in the day-to-day -day busyness of things, people can forget how, how um, awesome it is that so many people are trying to protect each other. And, that, and that, that people do slip, slip up and it takes a lot of uh, forgiveness. And wherever you are in that spectrum, it's like that <laughs> waiting. Um, just try to explore those aspects of it, the waiting with numbness, waiting for, with indifference, waiting with equanimity and waiting with no kindness. It's okay. It's just equanimity is present. That's great. That's great. That's a lot. And then want, noticing wanting more, wanting, wanting the kindness. It's all just like playing it out, you know. It's great. Yeah, you know, and I, I might just add that like part of the value, the spiritual value of this pandemic, if we choose to take it up, is the very fundamental and important reflection on death you know, that is a part of this tradition of, of really getting that this is going to happen to all of us. We don't know the circumstances. Some things are in our control, some things are not. And there are, there is this mystery to that, but there's not a mystery to the inevitability that there is something. And that I think technology and the age we live in, there's a, a defense against that truth and sickness. Um, that I think we can live in a certain fantasy of that's gotten a little shaken in, a, in, in ways that could be healthy, that we could sort of take it in. And so I think that other piece that we, you know, the last few weeks we've been doing of like around reflections on death and reflections on ownership of action and these things that, of course, you have to be careful with in terms of getting, you know, sort of too despondent about, but that they're, the sobering quality of them is, is also a relaxing and a relief and, and a quieting of, you know, I mean, you look at some of these, you know, in the tradition, you know, some of the, the contemplations uh, are, can get you into like states of deep absorption, even, even a contemplation of like unpleasant physical realities, right? And so it's like, oh, the thought of like that you could be in, you know, deep jhana of concentration and abiding and the vision of you know literally right it's like a, a bloated corpse <laughs> it's like wow what does that mean what does that mean really in terms of what liberation is and the, and the, the capacity of our mind to be freed through the truth and to be actually liberated and and uh, enlivened and and buoyant made buoyant through the truth so um when we have the strength, it's important, you know, it's important to just like really, to really also face and confront that piece of, of, of the truth of what we're living in right now and, and actually are always living in, but there are these reminders that are very intense and, and how to do that without feeling like we slip into just paranoia and anxiety all the time. It's, it's, it's a delicate dance, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think we have time for this one last question. Um, Kristen, are you there? Hi. Hi. Hey. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what my question is, but it just, a lot of what we talked about or you talked about tonight about uh, joy and the earlier question about joy is sort of resonated with me. Um, I was certainly joyful yesterday, but um, shockingly, I've, I've experienced great joy in 2020. And um, I had this really amazing experience during lockdown of dancing uh, with a dance teacher and finding this community of people. And I was doing it five days a week and that just went up, it was a huge part of like the lockdown experience for me. Mm -hmm. and it was wild. I've never been in my body like that before. I've never been out of my head like that before. I like didn't want to think with words. I, I, I guess you'd call it like a peak experience, but it was kind of sustained. As long as I could do this dance, I was bliss, blissed out, you know? And, but I knew that it wouldn't last forever. I knew that this was like, a, I, from a very giving teacher and there was this giving community and not everyone's gonna be locked in their houses forever. And this is, mm. well, the conditions are kind of bizarre and perfect for this, you know? And um, I found myself like, not wanting it to go away as it was happening. And I was watching myself get attached to it and um, wonder if it was about this particular teacher or if this was something I could cultivate on my own. Um, I don't really, I guess my, it's obviously subsided now. The world is sort of people are refinding their professional lives. Mm. Um, I just, I don't know. I guess I watched myself have all this fear that I would fall back to like a lower place before that I didn't want to go back to. Mm. And I think I've kind of decided that having these peak experiences and having these jo this joy shows you that it's possible and that, you, and that your floor doesn't have to, it raises your floor a little bit, I guess is what I've decided for myself, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, totally. I mean, I, I think that that's not in contradiction with the fundamentals of even of this lineage, right? Where we might not have ecstatic dancing, but there is the understanding that like, you know, these flight crowds just saying about these like, you know, profound absorption and the joy that can come from that and the, the relief and the, you know, degrees of, of refinement of that sort of qualities of peace that can come through what is actually control right? The controlling of the mind versus mindfulness. Like, so, so these are concentration practices versus wisdom practices and that they can be used to the benefit of wisdom practices, right? That, that you can use that clarity and that upliftment to then engage in the more sober act of the Vipassana and the mindfulness of moment to moment experience. And, um, and, and so that is very much, you know, kind of understood and the shadow of it is also understood, which you're clearly sensitive to, too, of like, oh, where am I just wanting to get high? And where mm -hmm. am I just want, sort of, act, you know, kind of clinging to it, but also getting that there's something actually whole, there's a wholesome pleasure in it that is good for me. And, you know, that's a, that's a powerful inquiry in terms of, and, and just continued, I think, places of exploring and, and experience in terms of, you know, all of our spiritual practices and the sort of array, array that we have of them. Um, and, I, and I think that sense of the way that the COVID or seclusion has, and some for many people also, yeah, protected and enabled different kinds of um, experiences that have been quite joyful or quite illuminating, I think is something that a lot of people share and don't in the sense of like, don't want to go back to just the way things were and kind of betray ourselves and in, in the ways that our busyness or our responsibilities or our social lives might um, is, is important and powerful. And I think the more we have community, I think is, is a really important part of that to support us in the like, all right, that, that drumbeat weekly, several times a week, whatever it is for whichever practice, you know, that sense of like, okay, if we can't always defend it uh, ourselves that there is a community of people that will help us kind of you know remember how much it's a priority for us in our lives yeah yeah I guess I've just found myself being very um feeling very like fragile and protective of this of the the joyful pretenses off during this crazy 2020 all of all of mm. the goodness that's come out of it and I want I find myself just wanting to be very protective of it. Yeah. 
Amen. <laughs> yeah. Michelle, you want to add? No? Next time I give a talk, I'll talk about the lineage of Ruth Dennison and Romper Home. Romper <laughs> Home. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard you so share something. <laughs> <laughs> romper Home. It sounds like Romper Room. <laughs> yeah. It is a lineage with Ruth. <laughs> but I think it's it's a good note to kind of leave on, which is like, it's not just you know, there's even ways all through our week, whether it's social media or it's just like, where are we finding balance? Where are we cheating ourselves from protection and from quietude and from all these things that we know we value? And then we undermine ourselves by like getting, well, it's like, I need to be angry. I need to find something to be angry about because there's like, and just like go fishing, you know, uh, or, or something to be like clingy about or whatever. And it's just like, wow, it's so deep. Why is it so hard to just like sit and stare out the window, you know, or, or, or find that place of neutrality. And I think that that's part of the lesson of where we are right now, where it's like, it's so high and low, it's so volatile. And we're not trying to, again, you're not trying to manage or control that necessarily, but we start to see that, boy, we, we do also have a resistance to the middle ground, to the neutrality, to the, the, that space of quietude sometimes. And um, can we start to kind of remember that we value that and have the body remember we value, have the mind remember that it values that, the heart. Um, and just to that, that sense of like, wow, it doesn't always need to be peak or trough, that there's, there's something about the kind of like normal and the, the, the regular and the basic that actually can be a real strong support for us in our days and weeks to come. So yeah, uh, take good care, everyone. Wonderful to see you. And um, I'm also feeling relieved right now. So uh, may we all be here and make it another week. We'll, we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> Take good care. Leone, oh, did you go off, Leone? Oh, she's there. Oh, yeah. It's It started at 2 o'clock Hawaii time, which the, there's no more daylight savings. So oh, it's, we don't, Hawaii doesn't do daylight savings. So it started at 4 your time. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so from now on, it'll be at 4 until the spring. Yeah, until the spring. Yeah. Good to see oh, you, yeah. Leonie. Uh -huh. You can <laughs> unmute. Yeah. I don't hear her. <laughs>